Hello, everyone. Uh, it's been a bit. Welcome uh, to all of you for coming today and joining us. We're excited to be back with a new Red Dot Cafe live conversation. I'm Angelica Cordero, the TEDx San Antonio license holder and lead organizer. I'll be your host for today's event. We want everyone to take part in this conversation. So please leave your questions and comments in the feed. As the chat continues, we'll be monitoring this feed to highlight questions that we might want be able to bring into our discussion. Today, we're happy to be joined by World War II historian and award-winning author, Keith Lowe. In 2014, Keith's TEDx Athens talk took a look at why are we so obsessed with World War II and took a look at some of the hidden motives behind our unhealthy obsession with the war. Today, he joins us to reflect on his talk and a deeper dive into our history with monuments. Please join me in welcoming Keith Lowe. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon, or good evening. <laughs> it's, it's, good evening, it's, yeah, here in London. Yeah, we're so excited to have you with us today. I know that we have quite a bit to chat about, um, so I thought we would just go ahead and, and get into our discussion. Um, I know that leading up to us even reaching out to you in the first place, I was lucky enough to be introduced to your talk through my graduate school program. I'm uh, studying currently to get my master's degree in World War II history. And one of the things that really stood out from your talk for me was just given the events of the last year, the spotlight on the importance of history and especially the monuments <laughs> that we've seen and the statues we've seen, all of the things that have been happening this last year has been pretty prevalent. Um, but I thought that where we could start maybe our discussion is first you, you asked this question about, you know, why are we all so obsessed with World War II? And I'm just curious personally, why why are you obsessed with world war ii <laughs> I, I mean that's quite a difficult question to answer you know it's <laughs> it's it's easier to answer at a sort of you know why is the world so obsessed but me it, it sort of goes goes quite deep you know I, I mean i have family who are involved in it i i grew up hearing stories about uh, world war ii in 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 asia actually from my from my grandfather uh, who fought in India uh, on the Burma front. Uh, so, you know, there's a, a sort of personal history of my family, which uh, is involved. Um, but I suppose re really it's it's just that the, the Second World War is the, I mean, it's the biggest story we, we have, isn't it? It's, it's the one story which has affected the entire world. You know, everybody's got a story about the Second World War. Everybody's got a grandfather or a cousin or a friend or uh, who was involved somehow in the Second World War. So, you know, there's there's such a wealth of stories there, and they're so dramatic. They're so, uh, you know, you got the good guys and the bad guys, and there's you know holocausts and bombings and explosion. I mean, it's got everything you you could ever want in 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 history, surely. So, uh, yeah. I, I, I am a self-confessed World War II geek, and I won't apologize for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can understand. Even There's even love when you start looking into the, the letters that they wrote to each other during that time. There's so much about family and just loss and grief and just so many different things. It's hard uh, to not get swept away in it all. Do you find with so many of that particular generation who did firsthand live through the war, do you find or, or have any concern about this, this same kind of obsession, this level of obsession we have right now? Are you have any concerns that in the future that it won't be, that it'll be less than a, 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 a diminished level of that level of obsession we have now because they're passing, they're passing away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, 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 I don't, I, I'm not concerned about that. I just see that as a natural, I mean, this, the natural course of, of things, isn't it? I mean, we had the same thing with the First World War, that when that ger generation was 
uh, passing away in sort of the, in the 1990s. We, I don't know how it was in the States, but here in Britain, we had a uh, sudden sort of flurry of interest in the First World War as the last guys were dying, you know, um, and that's natural. We, th these, these are people who are important to us and we want to rush in and get as much of their stories uh, and the, the sort of access to their real lived experience before you know we can't, can't get that anymore it's important to us so uh, we're kind of going through the same sort of thing now I mean, there are lots of people who i've interviewed over the years who who aren't around anymore uh, uh it, you know it seems like almost every week i hear another bit of sad news so uh yeah there is a, a specific reason why right now we're obsessed with the second world war on top of all the other yeah, you know, historical reasons why we would be. Yes. Uh, so I, I myself, my grandfather was a, a an army in the army as a private first class for um, the coast artillery, and then came back and he served overseas in Europe as well. So it I, it does seem like a lot of people's obsession currently has to do with the fact that it's familial. It's the the people in our lives. Um, I know that we just got a comment from somebody who's watching currently, um, Michelle Koch, who said, my grandfather was a Red Cross nurse stationed in France. My mother and my aunt were evacuated to the Cotswolds. Okay, so, right. <laughs> lots of people have that personal connection. Um, you know, one of the things that I have found really uh, interesting in the scholarship of this particular history is that, it, I mean, it spans so many different subjects. I feel like we say, okay, we're historians of World War II history, but then, <laughs> then you start getting into the nitty gritty and you're like, but what specifically? And so I know that your most recent book, Prisoners of History, more so particularly focuses on monuments. And I'm curious to know what took you from having a general obsession about the war to then getting to the more specifics of monuments themselves. Right. I mean, the monuments is just the sort of lens I've chosen to uh, explore um, how we remember the world. Because like you say, you know, there's there's a different story wherever you go and uh, you can choose a thousand different um, ways of looking at it. Um, I think this is another reason why uh, the Second World War is is such a an important part of our our sort of communal global um consciousness is because it doesn't really matter what story you want to tell you can use the second world war as a kind of screen to project your ideas on because everything's there you know if, if you're i don't know if you're if you're asian if you're filipino or, or from indonesia or for, from india the second world war is kind of the point where you um the 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 colonial authorities are, are, are losing power and you get the chance to have your independence story so there's a foundation myth going on in in asia if you're britain uh, british or american you can uh, talk about how you were the heroes of the second world war if you're polish or jewish or chinese you can talk about you know stories of martyrdom how you know the war destroyed your communities or, so there's every kind of story you can tell and you can use the Second World War as a way of telling that story of heroism or martyrdom or or a foundation myth for your for your country or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, you know. Go ahead. Well, I, mean, I was just thinking, monuments for me. Monuments are kind of. Um, I mean, if the Second World War is the screen, monuments are kind of some of the pictures we put on that screen, aren't they? Um, they're like s single images which try to sort of boil down. A whole great big story into one single picture right and how and how exactly do you do that right one of the yeah. things that you said um that really really resonated with me in your talk was that people don't like to remember the gray areas of of history and one of the things that it reminded me of uh, was brene brown's talk about vulnerability where she talks a lot about leaning into this discomfort and yeah. I, I felt like there was a lot of similarity in what you were trying to say about how we generally don't like these gray areas of history 
And the irony to me is that Brene's talk is very pervasive and very popular. And people talk so prophetically about how, how great it was that she was talking about it. And yet here we are having a discussion about history, the gray areas of history that people really don't like. Yeah, how, yeah. How, how do you perceive or, or think that maybe we can em start embracing more of these gray areas? And leaning into the, this discomfort. Yeah, I, 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 I've seen a couple of uh, of her um, TED talks. Actually, um, she's great, isn't she? She's a. She really is. <laughs> she's, you know, someone who can make you laugh, make you cry, and make you think all at once. You know, she's 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 really impressive. Yeah. Um, I, th I think one of, the, from memory, one of the things she talked about was. Um, us craving certainty and that's why we don't like to uh it's one of the reasons why we don't like to uh, lean into uh, uncomfortable subjects is because you know, we like to stick with something a bit more familiar that that you know we can be feel certain about and uh i think the stories that we tell about the second world war the sort of uh not, not necessarily the history of it but like the the, the way we've mythologized that history you know, we've got the good guys and the bad guys and you know, it's, a, it's a war of good and evil that's nice and comfortable and we're comfortable with that but for me <laughs> i'm like uh you know when you have like a, a a sore tooth and you can't stop playing with it with your tongue yes <laughs> for me that is the, it's the bits of history that you can't stop you know, even though you don't really want want to sort of look there, that they're, they're always there, and it's always sort of slightly uncomfortable. But you can't stop prodding at it. Those are the things that that really draw me. And uh, yeah, I think I think those are the interesting bits of history, really, because you know, why why do that? Why are they uncomfortable? Why mm -hmm. pain is there for a reason, right? Yeah. Because it, something something's not right. You need to do something about it. That's why you're prodding it with your tongue. And uh. Yeah. I sort of feel the same way about history that it's the the bits that that make me feel uncomfortable that i want to say oh, hang on well what why am i uncomfortable about that let's mm. let's take a little bit more let's lean into it as as she would say yeah let's lean into it and, and try and just live with the discomfort a bit and look at what it is Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting, uh, just this uh, recent week, I've been reading a lot more specifically about the Holocaust monuments and, and especially the ones that are overseas in Europe and in Israel uh, as compared to the ones here in the United States. And it does seem like a lot of the ones overseas and monuments generally overseas seem to provoke a lot more thought and, and discussion. And I I wonder sometimes whether or not that has to do with the fact that there is so much that has happened on the grounds of, and in the countries overseas versus here in the United States. One of the ones that uh, just kind of going off this theme of leaning into the discomfort are some of the sculptures that are at the the, the death camps. Um, I know that I've seen a couple that are art their art artistry, their public works of art. And there's a couple where you're meant to either engage directly with the monument. And uh, one, one specifically that comes to mind is, um, and I can't remember which death camp it's at, unfortunately, but you stand beneath it. And it's this massive, huge, ginormous, ominous rock that when you stand beneath it and you look out at the death camp, you're meant to feel, they wanted you to feel that, that, that weight yeah. of what the danger is, is from that. And I'm like, is that, is it something that maybe we have an opportunity to do more of with monuments themselves or, and how do we, how do we bring that into our, just our everyday vernacular of, mm -hmm of of this living in the gray area it's, yeah uh, how have you encountered oh go ahead no i was just i was just i'm thinking that you know america was lucky because you're far away from the fighting i mean there's a little bit in pearl harbor but the rest of the, you know the rest of the country is 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 far away so you get you know you get to view these things from a distance um and and the monuments really do reflect that they're quite 
uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, American monuments tend to be quite sort of formal. There's lots of like columns and wreaths and okay, angels, you know, things like that. They're sort of very traditional, uh, which is kind of comforting. Uh, but around Europe, in places where really horrible things happen, you, you don't have the luxury of feeling comfortable just by the virtue of you being there where you know a massacre has taken place. You cannot feel comfortable. And the monuments also reflect that. So that that, that one you 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 took I, I don't know which camp it was either, but uh, um, yeah, you you have to feel the 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 sort of weight of his. It's literally the weight of history on on your shoulders as you're as you're standing by these things. Have you found uh, in just in regular discussion with people that aren't necessarily historians or? Um, who don't have a personal affinity to want to study history? Uh, have you have you found any methods in which you've been able to kind of talk to them in ways to get them to lean into these gray areas that you mm -hmm. have found to be of success? Well, one of the things I find most difficult is when you're if you're talking to someone from a, a particular nationality. Um, I don't. Let's let's choose. I don't know, Poles, for example, po Polish people have a very sort of um, they have a very strong sense of the their own martyrdom in the past. You know, the country was massacred during the Second World War. More. I mean, they had six million deaths in Poland. Half of those were Jewish. The other half were, were, were Polish Catholics. And so on. I mean, the, the whole country was destroyed. So whenever you try to talk about some of the for example some of the bad things that some some polls did they get very very defensive mm. because they you know and, and it's understandable you know why are you concentrating on the, the the bad things that a few people did when there was all this which was done to us so i suppose sometimes when i'm talking to people rather than rather than concentrate on what you did what you guys did i i, I bring it back on myself you know my my country i say well you know britain betrayed poland we did these ter we did this terrible thing to you guy we we left you in the lurch in 1939 we sold out half of your country to stalin in 1945 we did terrible things i start with that before inviting them to look at uh, some of the difficult things about their past it's it's always easier if you cast the first stone at yourself <laughs> Um, rather than at the other person, I I I, I found. Mm -hmm. Have you have you encountered any really interesting or unusual perspectives in in discussion in that in that frame? Things that have maybe uh, caught you by surprise. Caught me by surprise. Well, not really. That have caught me by surprise. I mean, there there are uh, uh, things that sadden me. Um, uh, because I can see them coming, and and I'm, I'm hoping they won't. So um, there's a, there's often this sort of unhealthy argument about memorialization between, I mean, uh, just stick it. Sorry, Poland. Um, I'll stick with you for the moment. But between Poles and Jews, for example, in Israel, there's a sort of argument going on about like who's got the greater victimhood status, which um, uh, is sort of understandable given the trauma that both sides have gone through, but. Uh, you know, it, it shouldn't be some sort of competition. It, that, that really saddens me when I see that kind of thing going on. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna take a question from someone who's watching right now. Laura asks, are there any World War II monuments you have not visited that you would like to go to? Ooh, um, that's a good question. Uh, let me think. Yes, I'd really. There's one in Brazil that I never uh, got to see. It's. Uh, I mean, I've seen pictures of it, but uh, it's it's a, a monument to the Brazilians who fell in the Second World War, because of course Brazilian soldiers were there, but there was only a small. There was like a. I think they suffered uh, one or two thousand people uh, died fighting on behalf of Brazil. But they have this massive monument, sort of completely out of proportion to the, the the what their actual role in the war was, 
which I'd really like to go and see. Uh, and, and, you know, because it's in Brazil and it's far away and I, I've never managed to get there. So that's, <laughs> that's the one I'd like to see. That's really interesting uh, that there's even one in, in South America because I, I know from uh, just in, in being in the program that generally, I don't know that we ever really talk about Latin America's involvement in the war at all. Hmm. That's really... Well, well, I mean, of course, the secret of these things is that it's not really about the Second World War at all. <laughs> it's about Brazil. It's about sort of national glory. And they want to share in the same sort of idea of heroism that the British and the Americans have, uh, the, the sort of North Americans have, for being the heroes of the war who went in and liberated Europe, you know, because they did too. It was yeah. only a small number of people, but they were there. So they, they it's, a, it's, a, it's not a monument about the Second World War. It's a, it's a monument about Brazilian greatness. That's what it's really about. Now, that's why it's so big. <laughs> yeah. Do you find that there are a larger percentage of monuments that are specifically in the same vein that are not about the war, but a byproduct of what you were talking about with wanting to feel a part of it and the nationalism of it versus actual monuments that are specifically for the war? <laughs> well, I, I think that all monuments are not only about their subject, they're also about the people who built them. So, uh, you know, if, if there are there are monuments which were built directly after the war, uh, which are about that time, and they're indisputably just about the events. Uh, they're com commemorating events that were very recent at the time. Um, so there's one in the book I talk about, which is a, a shrine in, in Bologna to the fallen, to the people who were, who were um, uh, executed by the Germans and so on. They've got this whole big... Uh, uh, lots of portraits all along the wall of one side of a piazza um, showing all of the partisans who were killed by the Germans in the, the course of the Second World War. That was originally put up in 1945 directly after it had happened. So people were still mourning when they put it up. That's something to do with the war and the war alone. But if you get a monument which was built in 1970 or, or, or like the Bomber Command Memorial in London built in 2012, you know, that's as much about London in 2012 as it is about the Second World War. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, the one thing that I feel like I've learned the most about, especially from just reading your book and in this course, is that there are details with regards to monuments themselves that when you go to visit it, it, you, there's so much more you can get out of the engagement when you start looking at the smaller details like when was it built and what was happening in the world at the time in which it was built and who were the people that were involved and even considering something as minor as or where the site of the monument actually is <laughs> you know it's geography and what made them choose to go the route of something very figurative and very literal versus something incredibly abstract uh, has been just it's changed how I I will forever now go to visit any monument, any statue, or anything, um, just thinking about all of these uh, small little details. Um, in terms of historical significance, what, what monument, in your opinion, has been overlooked? And why do you suppose it has been overlooked? Overlooked? Uh... Well, do, you, do you mean a, a, a monument which does exist, which people don't know about, or a monument that should be built, which hasn't been? What? Maybe, uh, what, why not both? <laughs> 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 In either case, I could understand why it would, they would, it would both be significant. Uh, well, uh, I mean, in terms of um, m monuments which have been built, but which are kind of invisible, I mean, there, there, there used to be a sort of academic theory about monuments that, that why are they always invisible? No, people walk past them without seeing these monuments. Um, I, th I think over the after the events of last year, uh, I think that that theory has gone. <laughs> people are <laughs> they notice monuments everywhere now. Um, but there are some that are designed to be invisible. And uh, there's one I talk in the book about in the book, which is in um, in Ljubljana in, in Slovenia. Uh, 
Slovenia was a part of Yugoslavia during the Second World War, um, before independence and so on. Um, if you uh, people, if people don't know where it is, it's like at the top of Italy, just round the coast. If you if you head east from Venice around the coast, the first country you get to is Slovenia, and uh, they had a really gruesome history in uh, 1945 because you know that was where the all the German army were retreating uh, northwards taking all their collaborators along with them and the partisans were following afterwards and they got to uh, the border with Austria and met the British tried to surrender to the British and we turned them back to be massacred and they were massacred in uh, tens of thousands taken off and and uh, uh, shot and and thrown down into sort of uh, ravines or down mine shafts I mean tens of thousands of these people it was really quite gruesome and um this was never really commemorated because it's quite a difficult you know ha how do you commemorate something like that these are fascists who are being killed by communists you know neither side no, nobody likes either side really so uh in Ljubljana, they created this monument, which is these just two monoliths, which stand sort of opposite one another. Um, they're just like two big blank walls. They don't really say anything. And uh, you walk past them and you just sort of look at them and you think, well, there's just two big blank walls. I mean, wh what do they mean? The politicians who put that up did so, <laughs> did it in that way because the 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 feelings around this subject are still so raw and people don't know where to put themselves and there's some you know there's some people on the on the left of the political spectrum who, who hate the fascists and others on the right of the political spectrum think the communists are the worst and and uh rather than confront the issues they just sort of made these this very vague sort of abstract almost invisible monument to kind of disperse the uh the uh the feelings around it so something like that is a is a is a monument which is overlooked i suppose <laughs> um monuments that that uh haven't been built but should have been i mean that would have been one of mine had it not been built but uh, i think that the 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 idea that the second world war finished in may 1945 is is sort of foolish because of course the violence carried on for months if not years afterwards and i think there's not really a monument to the 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 chaos which happened after the war is supposed to be over but people are still killing each other mm. that's what i'd like to see something something that would work on that level that's a really interesting thought um i often find myself questioning whether or not the war has ever ended just considering just the uh, almost domino effect from the violence and even the politics and just the, the philosophical and ideological things that came out of the war I just all that entire war i feel like was just the beginning of something that kind of had a, a domino effect it's interesting to think about how do you how do you commemorate something like that knowing that that those things carried over and continue to carry over from war to war to war to war that's really interesting i would love mm. something like that that would be very 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 cool um it looks like we've got another question so i'm gonna go ahead and go there let's see so robin lacourt uh, says i'm so glad you brought this brought up the Slovenia monument. Did you ever feel that your safety was in question when you were exploring there or for that matter anywhere while you were researching your book? No, I never, never felt that my uh, safety was uh, in question. No, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a coward. Really. I'm not, <laughs> I don't go to war zones and uh, I mean, there, there are uh, uh, Second World War monuments in the Libyan desert, for example, I could have visited, but I'm not going to Libya. <laughs> Someone else more intrepid than me can go and do that work. What's the monuments? That, what's the monument in Libya? Um, well, because in North, North Africa, there was that's where um, there's a, was a lot of desert fighting and so on. Um, right, the North African campaign is exactly. that in relation to that. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I'll have to look that one up. I'm so curious to see it. Um, when you were talking about the the Slovenia 
monument, it reminded me of how there are ones that have been in existence and then decades later, what they've done is that they've moved them and put them into either parks or indistinguishable areas. I know that there's, I, I believe it's a Stalin or a Lenin one or some a Russian one where they moved it from where it was uh, very in, a, in the center of town, a plaza of some kind, and they put it <laughs> in a park and one of the things I, I believe that the writer was uh, saying about it is that it's almost like it's a desecration of, of, of it in many cases because the birds can can poo on it and nobody's yeah. going to clean it. And what that signifies in, in of its own kind uh, in that action of moving things. Did you come across a lot of a lot of that kind of unique um, after the fact? desires from communities with regards yeah, to yes. I mean the, the 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 one you're talking about is Grutas Park in 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 Lithuania um near near the Baltic coast um there there are a lot of uh I mean when when the your communism ended in in Europe and so on they they took down a lot of the Stalin monuments and the various communist monuments uh Stalin uh, Stalin's a, a, a weird case because he was actually taken down quite often earlier on by the communists themselves after he was sort of discredited. But, you know, nevertheless, he is this sort of, you know, so-called war hero. Uh, and uh, there is a monument to him which has been moved and put into this uh, park in 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 Lithuania. Uh, that's one of my favorite places in Europe, actually. I, 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 I want to go back. I want to visit this place again. It's um, it's kind of crazy. It's it's a park, a monument park, which was set up by. Uh, I mean, the government had all these monuments, and they didn't know what to do with them, so they they, they put them out to tender and said, you know, some somebody make a park for this thing. And um, uh, the KGB museum put in a bid. Some other uh, another history museum put a put in a bid, but the guy who won the bid was the only one who said, uh, you don't have to give me any money. I'll pay for it all myself and I'll, I'll renovate all the monuments. And he was, he wasn't a history professional or a museum expert or anything like he was a, an ex wrestling champion uh, <laughs> who was a, a, made his living as a mushroom farmer. <laughs> that is this is the guy who got hold of all these monuments. Wow. And he set, up, he set up this park and he put them up and, and he thought, you know, I want to make this a tourist destination. So, uh, well, we've got to have something for the kids. So let, let's also put a zoo in there and like a big playground and we can have tanks and the, the kids can climb on the tanks and they can also climb on the on the climbing frames. And and uh, we'll put, you know, Lenin in a field with some llamas and <laughs> yeah, they can wander around it. Wow. It's a bizarre place and a sort of tasteless uh, kitsch. Uh, I mean, also around the perimeter, they've got the bar like barbed wire fences with guard towers. So it's like you're going into a sort of gulag theme park as well. And they've got yeah. black speakers playing old Soviet music. And it's just weird. <laughs> this place is really weird. That sounds it, so fascinating, though. <laughs> it, it sort of works because yeah, because these these old monsters from history are kind of being ridiculed in this. I mean, I don't know if, how much of it is by design, but <laughs> they are being ridiculed. You know, you you've got Lenin there in a, in a field with llamas. You can't take him seriously. It's not like he's when he was standing on the town square with you know above everybody. He's there surrounded by animals. It sort of it, takes the sting out of it, you know. Yeah, it it further it. It further makes the argument of needing to better understand the intention of the person and how and in doing that and constructing that that entire facility. It, did he did he mean for it to be perceived in that uh, from that perspective or did he not? I mean, I, I, I think uh, he's is the sort of guy who has a, a bit of a twinkle in his eye, you know, so I, I, I think he uh, he was definitely trying to ridicule these things. Yeah, that's so interesting, though. I could never imagine something like that happening to, here in the United States. But <laughs> it would be very fascinating um, to do. 
Um, when it, when can, I, can I just say though that that I mean it wasn't universally popular there either. I mean yeah. there was a lot of kickback against this guy. They you know people saying you're you know you're ridiculing our, our suffering here, and there there was a a lot of complaints about it. So. Uh, it it reminds me of something that you mentioned in the book. I believe it was in your in your last chapter that you're talking about um, about what are the alternatives, especially with these problematic monuments and statues that we have. And one of the things that um, you had made as a suggestion was, is there some kind of statue park we go to? Like, how do we continue to have this opportunity to? Um, to, to engage with this history because it's still incredibly important. The statue may be incredibly problematic, but there are so many things that we can still learn in, in, in going to visit them. So what's the, what's the alternative? Um, but it does make me wonder then, are, does a, a statue park have that same sentiment that this, this, <laughs> this location you're talking about where it kind of cheapens the the statues themselves it's it's a it's always a catch-22 i feel mm. i feel like mm. everything when you talk about any kind of solution um especially with problematic monuments it's always it's always incredibly complex yeah yeah i mean there's there's a we had similar things happening here with uh, that you had in the states last year where where you know, people were tearing down uh monuments to do with slavery and colonialism um that kind of thing but there was there, there is one um quite prominent monument in um in scotland of the duke of uh, the, the the duke of wellington who was famous for being in the battle of waterloo against napoleon but he was also a colonial figure you know he was he was part of the 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 group who subjugated india so you know, he could really have been a focus for attack, but he wasn't, unlike a lot of the other monuments. And the reason, I think, the reason why this particular monument wasn't attacked is because ever since the 1980s, he's had a traffic cone on his head. <laughs> it's like a, a Scottish sense of humour that every time they take the traffic cone off, someone else climbs up and puts the traffic cone back on. So this this statue has always had a traffic cane on its head and that kind of takes this you, you can't take it seriously so it's taken the sting out of uh, the humor has taken the sting out of the you know the the dodgy parts of the history there so it, it's it, kind of more acceptable somehow because he's got a traffic cane on his head i don't know if that's a, an answer for uh you know sticking Oh, I, I, I think Confederate statues or something. I don't know. Oh, I mean, that would be, I mean, if I will be very surprised if that ever happens. And if it does, I will have to say that it's a testament to, to you in many cases, because I don't know that many people even know anything about that particular monument. Um, I, but it's, it's really interesting to consider. It, it, the other thing too that it makes me uh, think about is form particularly. So usually people think of a monument under the guise of it being some kind of specific structure, a statue of some kind, a monolith, a cenotaph of some kind. But it, it does seem like we're, we're muddling a lot of our perceptions about what monuments um, can be and the potential of them in the future and how do we marry this idea of the living in the gray uh, what do you what in your opinion do you think uh, constitutes a, a monument well um when it comes to things like uh, statues and so on um they're they're quite often um they're quite often not really about history so much as about our values. You know, there's, there's, like, I don't know, a, a, a symbolic significance of the of the form of the statue takes. Um, uh, but there's all kinds of other things. You know, monoliths, for example, that's more abstract. Um, but you can go, you can just have a plaque on a wall. I mean, that's that anything that sort of carries some kind of message about the past or some carries memory. Can be a monument so for example i went to oslo a, a few years back and there's a um the the prime minister of of norway during the second world war vidkun quisling 
huge collaborator, helped the Germans out in, in, in occupying the country and so on. After the Second World War, he was executed. He was shot against this wall in the center of town. And you can go there and you can go to this wall and there are the bullet holes in the wall. You can stand there and, and touch these bullet holes. Wow. It's just a wall, but it carries the memory because of what happened there. So I figure for me, a monument is anything which carries that kind of memory of the past. Um, yeah. One of the, not to keep harping on Holocaust monuments, but I, it's only because it's been more recently in my in my mind uh, and, and just in reading currently. But as you you were talking, the thing that it reminded me of was the anti the anti monument um, um, uh, movement and how there are some that they they use people as as the the people to take the actual physical place of of a monument i know that there's a couple where what they've done is that in the location where they had um burned the books uh where, where the nazis had burned the books that they actually went and they submerged and went down into the ground and built a a library or a library uh, it's empty bookshelves and so when you stand above it you look down it's it's a weird it's a, a different take on this on this act of remembrance that what they wanted people to do is to know that we are the ones that are the are responsible for memory and remembrance and the act of remembrance and so instead of erecting something they were doing these different things it's really mm -hmm really interesting, really fascinating how they're doing something very different. Um, another example that you had pointed out in, in your book was the Liberation Europe, the the connection where it's a ah, yes. path. And yeah. I found that to be really interesting as well. Would you would you explain a little bit? You, you would be a little more uh, well-versed in explaining a little bit yeah. about what, what that exactly is and the significance of it well, well this is something that's uh, that's really quite unique um it's it's the only example i can think of of a transnational monument it's a it's a hiking trail which goes from the beaches of normandy uh, where british and americans and canadians landed on d-day and it follows their path all the way through europe all the way to berlin and along the way you can visit various um, battlefield sites, um, museums that are along the way, um, sites where atrocities took place, all, all kinds of things dotted along this line. So it's almost like a, almost like a sort of pilgrimage route, I suppose. And so it's this, it's, um, I can't remember how many miles it is, a few hundred miles uh, of, of hiking trail through Europe. Um, there's something about that, which is sort of, wonderful really because uh you you as you're walking along you're you're remembering stuff um but it's it's also it's not taking any one particular point of view you you can take lots of different points of view depending on where you are along the trail and that's that's quite something i think do you think that that um tying those different national monuments together what what kind of impact do you think that that has as, as far as combating um, the, the differing perspectives or those perspectives that are at odds with each other? Well, this is this is the thing. You, every, every nation has its own um, view of what the Second World War was, and and they don't always match up, do they? Um, I mean, this this is a sort of initiative which has been endorsed by the Council of, Council of Europe. Uh, so it's I mean. It, there is kind of a sort of political meaning behind this uh, in that Europe as a whole was destroyed by the Second World War. And, and now we have this sort of Europe as a whole, uh, which Britain has just left. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there, there's political meaning in this this um, hiking trail. They, they've tried very. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm I know some of the people who are involved in setting this thing up. And they've tried very hard to steer clear of the political meaning because they don't want to get involved in that. But 
you can't escape the fact that it does it's got, it's going to have for anybody walking along it now thinking of europe as a whole and this this drive to liberate europe as a whole and the europe as a whole that we have now uh, in the european union they're all linked aren't they i mean the second world war is the foundation myth of the european union so you can't escape from it no matter how much you want to <laughs> How do you think a, a um, an initiative like this, if if let's say in the United States we were to do some kind of linkage of our own, because I mean here we have something very similar, I, I, not with regards specifically to World War II, but I think of our just even our national history of itself. There have been migrations of people from the South who fled to California and to the North in hopes of a better life. And uh, there's plenty of other things like Manifest mm. Destiny. And when we were trying mm. to um, get the, more- The more freedom money, trail. There's, there's, mean, there's, yeah, there's the Underground Railroad. I mean, there's so many mm. different things that I, I, I wonder if we were to do something similar like this, um, if, if it would have the same resonance that it seems like it may have better in in europe i don't i don't know um i'd be curious your opinions well i, sh I, I don't see why not i mean that, something like the underground railroad i mean that's 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 got it's not it's not just a sort of a little thing this is a, got huge emotional power uh for a lot of people i mean so i don't i don't see how that could would be any less significant than the the liberation route europe um which has a, a an emotional si significance for for Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, the, because the Liberation Europe one, I'm only thinking like how they have. There's different perspectives from different nations that they have their own manner in which it manifested in the monument itself. So I wonder if there's opportunity for us to take something like the Underground Railroad and the Confederate mon monuments together. And how mm -hmm. do you how do you yeah, Come that would be that would be interesting. Yeah, right. Uh, like going back to what we were talking about at the top about living in the gray and and leaning into this discomfort is uh, is there opportunity for us to do stuff like that? It'd be it'd be really interesting. It would. It would. It'd be it'd be difficult to to sell, I imagine. But uh, uh, <laughs> but you know, that, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I I think it's important to try and think of you know, it's very easy just to just to to tear monuments down and sometimes yeah sometimes frankly you should tear them down i mean it's like it, you don't want to give honor to something which is shameful but at the same time sometimes it's good to be reminded of your own shame you know i mean i i i remember um a few years back um uh, you know in france uh, in lots of places in europe they have this uh, tradition of naming streets and squares and schools and so on after famous people uh, there used to be loads of streets named after Marshal Philippe Pétain, who was the, the sort of hero of the First World War. But in the Second World War, of course, he was head of the collaborationist government in France. So, you know, all his heroism leached away and he was suddenly a traitor. So all the streets that used to be named after him have, have gradually through the years had name changes. And the last one went, uh, I think it was it was in the news about four or five years ago. The, the last street named after him was was renamed and that means that every time someone walks down that street they're not reminded a of their first world war heroism but b of also their second world war shame and and the combination of those two things i think is everybody's got shame and pride in in their past and we should be reminded of both things not just one or the other no, ma no matter how painful it may be so trying to find some creative way of making sure that we 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 experience that shame as well as that glory, I think is really important for any society. Um, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I know that we're getting close to the end of our hour together and it's been such a, a great conversation. I'm sure that you and I could talk uh, ad nauseum. Um, uh, so it does, I just wanted to end, I think, on this one thought that kind of riffs off what you're talking about. Uh, that is, we all come from different cultures, generations, and experiences. And 
as a historian, I'm sure that you've found your own tools in helping to, to change your thought process to combat your own memory bias. So what are some that you would suggest uh, that we can all incorporate into our own thought process, process to help combat our own memory biases? Wow. Uh, I mean, one thing I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm constantly aware of the fact that I'm a, a white middle class um, English, quite privileged man. Uh, so you know, I tick a lot of boxes for for privilege. Um, I was also privately educated. I mean, how 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 far do you want to go? Um, and it's important to remember those things when I'm when I'm writing about a subject that that I, I'm not black. I'm not a woman. I'm not uh, a, a working class individual. But I, I don't think it's enough to try and and just incorporate that into your thoughts because you, you're you're always going to make mistakes. You're always going to going to forget you know one aspect, and you're always going to be. It's not the, the the problems that you see. It's the problems you don't see. Um, so. For me, it's it's not just only a, a, about uh, thought processes. I, I think you've got to be a bit more hands on about it. I mean, even if it's just something as simple as doing what what doctors do or pilots do, you know, make a checklist, write it down. You know, I <laughs> you write down a list of your attributes: white, middle class, male, uh, whatever, and 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 write a list of the opposite, and then look at the you know. Okay, hang on a sec. How would this look if I was a woman? How would it look if I was black? How would it look if I was, I don't know, not European, but African? Um, and if you've got that list in front of you, then you can check them off that at least you've considered it. You might not get it right, but at least you considered it and, and tried to find sources from those places as well. Not, not just look at the same old sources that you always look at. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's what I do anyway. I, I, I have a a, a list in front of me that of, of things that I will I am bound to forget to do just to remind me to do them I love that it's it's the same that I do myself so it's good to hear that there are others who have similar practices as well well it's yeah. been I mean it's been a great hour I again I could speak I could talk to you ad nauseum for forever um but I know that we're at the top of the hour so I, just to close off everything how can people stay in touch with you oh uh I'm on Twitter at Keith Low Author um I've got a website which is uh I'm gonna get this wrong keithlowhistory.com oh there you go it's on the screen um <laughs> So I, you can contact me through there or, or, or on my Twitter address. Fantastic. Uh, so um, any uh, before we wrap, just wanted to allow for any parting thoughts before we, we close. Uh, no, just that it's been a delight and really, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for having a, ha being a part of this today. I look forward to at any time, any other time you want to come on, <laughs> let us know. <laughs> Thank you for coming on today. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Uh, so give many thanks to Keith and make sure that you follow him online. Uh, in the for any future episodes of Red Dot Cafe, you can always come here on Facebook and we'll be on YouTube and Twitter as well. Also, we're in the process of looking for volunteers. If you want to volunteer with our organization this year, please visit us at TEDxSanAntonio.com. Any future, a uh, whole bunch of future episodes are in the works. We're really excited about what we've got on Slate for this year. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again Take care.